It's about to go down with Mark and Kathy, a live coaching show about dropping ideas. Mark and Kathy coach and have conversations with brilliant idea creators who are reimagining the world through the expression of their words, thoughts, and action. Hey, everybody. I am Kathy Armias. And I am Mark Williams. And we want to welcome you to another episode of It's About to Go Down. And today joining us, listen, I could get into the official title, but what I love is that she calls herself a lover of kale. She's actually a lover of kale and a lover of burpees. So you know she's out of her mind. (laughs) But in actuality, in all seriousness, Today, we are joined by the CEO and founder of True Measure, which is an employee well-being consultancy. And that leads us into what Sophia Askar is going to talk to us about today. So, Sophia, you have this whole idea about how we should take things from workplace wellness to employee well-being. And I've already got a ton of questions about the difference between wellness and well-being. So tell us why we should be going from employee from from workplace wellness to employee well-being. How did you come up with this idea and why are you the one to talk about this idea? There's about five to seven questions in there, Mark. Good job. (laughs) (laughs) We got a little Uh, time, Sophia. (laughs) Yeah, perfect. Uh, I think I'll start with uh, why the shift. And I think workplace wellness has focuses really most heavily on health. So the focus is on health. So when you say workplace wellness, the thing that first comes to mind for most people is, oh, on-site yoga classes. I mean, what else do you think of? Uh, A biggest loser contest, losing weight, you know, those types of things that don't necessarily yield long-term results. And employee well-being, the, the whole, let's let's take look at wellness versus well-being. So wellness is the absence of disease. So that's being healthy. Well-being is a bigger bucket that includes things like mental well-being, emotional well-being, environmental, like how satisfied and happy and fulfilled are you at your job? How good of a communicator are you? How do you feel heard? Do you feel empowered? Um it's it's a really big picture. Like, are you feeling like your strengths are being used at work? Do you feel safe to communicate? Do you feel appreciated, valued? There's a lot more to there. It's much more descriptive of the rich experience that humans really have when they're at work, not just, you know, are you costing the, the company a lot of money because of your healthcare claims? And I think that workplace wellness is too much focused on those outcomes. Wow, a major light bulb just went off. <laughs> right? I wasn't expecting that. Wow. You know, I, I've known Sophia for a long time, and I don't think I would have ever, I don't think if she pop quizzed me, I would have been able to answer the difference between wellness and well-being. So, wow. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think Sophia, you know, like when people are really close to their ideas or they, they, they're close to their work, they know their work inside and out, and they might take for granted sometimes what what other people may or may not know. I bet you, if you pinged a hundred people on the streets and said, "Hey, what's the difference between wellness and well being?" I think you might find one person that could kind of navigate their way through it. That's that would be my guess. Yeah, and I think most other people would just say, "Well, isn't that the same thing?" <laughs> yeah, I would think that. Um, I love what. I love what you said, though, Sophia, and I would really love to get into this a little bit more, you know, breaking this down as an idea. You said well-being is more of the human richness experience or something like that. Like, I really love that. As opposed to wellness, was, which is just the absence of disease. Mm-hmm. Of course, they go hand in hand, right? Yes. If yeah, you- they're definitely related. It's just wellness is the, you know, part of the spectrum of health. So there's disease. And then there's being healthy and wellness takes it a little bit further um, with some positive focus. So it's not just, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. It's not just getting blood work done and, you know, things are not wrong. You know, so there's no reason to go to the doctor. 
you know, there's the positive side of that. So there's this whole other spectrum on the other side, which is, you know, happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, um, self-awareness, um, you know, rich social life. And those are not captured in the word wellness. Mm -hmm. So with your idea, like, and I know that you are, you are doing, you have been doing, True Measure has been doing this for organizations for a very long time. What's kind of been the big shift after the pandemic and having people work from home and a lot of different issues that people are having, like what, what's kind of the big idea that if you wish you could go into every single one of your clients and they would already like understand this idea? The one big thing that first comes to my mind is people are important. We really need to care about them. Mm. One of the things that came out of a lot of suffering, especially early on in the pandemic, when parents were trying to figure out how they were going to homeschool their kids and get internet that would work so they could Zoom and their kids could Zoom and they could work remotely. And how are they going to handle homework and their kids' depression from being isolated and all of those things. And then we started seeing each other in our pajamas with our animals going back and forth. And, uh, you know, it's just (laughs) and the reality of life. I mean, it forced organizations, teams, groups, supervisors, peers, and colleagues all to confront the reality that you are cooperating and working with other human beings that have, you know, fears, insecurities, challenges, joys, and triumphs. And, you know, it just, it it opened up our experience of each other. And, I think that is what I wish every all companies had and acknowledged before the pandemic. And I'm hoping that that awareness will keep moving forward. And, um, you know, we're seeing that there's more demands for work life balance, flexible work schedules, benefits, you know, child care, things that benefits family and that that balanced life that people are looking life experience that they're looking to have. So my hope is that that aware that focus will continue. Mm. I love that. People are important. We really need to take care of them. Yep. Mm. And it's not just for the numbers, right? Because, you know, when, when people are stressed and not sure how they're going to get their work done, if they're sitting there worried about, you know, am I going to have a zoom connection for this important sales call? Um, or, you know, and if this deal doesn't go down, then my numbers aren't up and I'm going to get fired or the company performance is going to go down or any of those consequences. If they're constantly stressed about those types of things. That's going to play into their performance at work, you know, and it's not just about physical health, right? I mean, physical health and reducing your health care cost is more important than ever now because those are going through mm-hmm. the roof. But honestly, it's, you know, mental health, emotional function. Mm-hmm. Those, I mean, I think m- hopefully majority of people have noticed how impactful those factors are. And it's not just soft skills anymore. You know, emotional Mm -hmm. is not just soft, fluffy stuff that you do on your own time. Guess what? Emotions rule the world. Talking to a marketer here, Kathy, you know that it's like (laughs) people buy on emotion and they justify with logic afterwards. (laughs) Don't use my book against me, Sophia. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love so that. Cool. I I love that you have categorized this, um, you know, well-being as a soft skill. Like that is a that's a big that's a big idea. Mark, I'm. You know, I, yeah, go ahead. No, no, yeah. no, no, ahead, no, no, no. All <laughs> right. Um, I like that you categorized it, and I like that you distinguish the two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So thank you for helping us understand the difference between what what's resonating with me right now is I didn't hear you say that we need workplace wellness and employee well-being. I heard you use this word shift. And I'm very curious because we've been talking about the difference, but the 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 word choice of shift, I'm curious why you're using that word shift and how important is that to the overall idea? Why do we need to shift from workplace wellness to employee well-being? That's a great question and it's crucially important. Uh, So workplace wellness is a very narrow focus uh, with very specific 
targeted outcomes. And typically it's been uh, siloed into HR or a subset of HR. Um, and employee well-being really has to do with company culture, leadership, uh, like per- psychological safety, safety, uh, when people are stressed, not getting enough sleep, um, not feeling safe to communicate safety hazards, they're going to be more stressed and safety issues happen. So it's really about not just the whole person, whole person, also the whole company. Mm. That's the short answer. Mm, Whole person. So it's important to just not just focus on one little aspect of health, but the overall big picture for the company, big picture for teams, because you have individuals, their well-being, you have team well-being, like how healthy is this team? How healthy is this company? Those all, those different levels all play together. And the well-being umbrella is much bigger and it has much farther reaching vision. And that goes all the way up to the top with the vision mission of the company. Um, and culture, company culture, whereas wellness really just focuses on very narrow targeted outcomes and is not being paid attention to with the people that are driving the, the vision and the uh, mission for the company and driving operations for the company. They're looking at bottom line, they're looking at goals, they're looking at revenue growth, but all of those factors when it comes to success of an organization rely on employees being well you know, mm-hmm. physically, mentally, and emotionally, mm-hmm. not just trained to do their job well. Mm-hmm. I know. So good. Mm-hmm. I, I can't help. My brain keeps going to the space. I love, I love like new information. And so I, mm-hmm. I, I, the first thing that I was thinking about is now we're talking about well-being being this very large, bigger umbrella Sophia, what is something that you teach or within that subset of well-being that most of us wouldn't know? That most of us wouldn't. I mean, we hear a lot about mental health and we hear a lot about a lot of the topics that you mentioned. But what's something that you would say that you teach or you talk about or that you bring to organizations that we don't normally think about, maybe? Hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is boundaries, Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of when I'm training with leadership teams, there's a lot of obvious things that go into leadership um, and communicating with direct reports and peers and supervisors. Uh, but I think and it's also a, a concept that's come up quite a bit during the pandemic, especially with work life balance. You know, you know, my company has you know, my team has done one on one health coaching with hundreds and hundreds of employees for many of our clients over before during the pandemic and just being able to see like how much uh stress occurs when there's not clear boundaries with work life like being able to walk away from your from your work being able to turn off and always that sense of always being turned on whether you're at work uh, and you're, you can't get any focus time because you're constantly working with people, um, whether you're on because you can't turn your work off, you know, whether personal concerns are so jacked up that you can't turn that off while you're working. It's just finding those. And that goes to like individual personal well-being, mentally, emotionally, finding, you know, maintaining and managing your own mental boundaries, emotional boundaries, work bound, physical boundaries, time management, like everything, all these factors play into that. And I think that's a lot of those things are overlooked with traditional leadership training or traditionally when we look at like, I need to get healthier. Well, okay, move more, eat less, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) But, But the reality is like putting anything into practice, if you can't fit things in within realistic boundaries, they aren't gonna happen. Right. Is it is there also a great correlation with like, I feel like some of the things that you said in the boundary space is shifting a little bit, you know, in our it, just in the world in general, you know, just the world in general is more like shifting towards this space. I mean, if you kind of look at every actual generation and and how, you know, like my for instance, my grandfather like had the work mentality of like, 
No, you like you work at one place, you work there 50 years and you retire mm-hmm. from there and mm-hmm. your work comes before your family mm-hmm. and your work is really important. I mean, some of the things like, mm-hmm. I mean, if he heard any of this now, he would probably be thinking, what a bunch of softies. <laughs> and, it, and it's and it's so wrong, right? But it's like... <laughs> I mean, I'm grateful we're having this conversation, but I can hear like what he would be, you know, saying. So some of that's like a, a big shift in the world too, as well, right, Sophia? Yeah. And I think the big shift there is that, you know, graduating out of that industrialization mindset where I'm a worker bee or a cog in the wheel to yeah. I'm a valuable human being. My experience is valuable. I deserve to have a happy life. I enjoy I deserve to enjoy my life. And I think that's where that shift is coming from. And I really appreciate the younger generations, the millennials and the globals, because they're really bringing um, a lot to that conversation. And it is a challenge with multi-generational workplaces because, you know, the boomers and the Xers, you know, were like, hey, work hard, work hard, work hard, push, push, push. Success, you know, is that badge of busyness. Um, <laughs> I like that. I like that. All right. So, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually went to a workshop on. It was about preventing burnout and <laughs> you know self care, right? Okay. Yeah. And here's what stood out to me, Sophia. At one point, the facilitator asked everybody in the room, so why did you choose to come? Mm. And most of the people in the room, while they said, yeah, yeah, and I'm interested in self-care, most of them said, because I have to get professional development. Uh, yes. Mm. Right? And, <laughs> and then on top of that, I caught a sneak peek of the attendance sheet. And there were probably about 30 people who signed up, but only five of us who showed up. And my thought was, even though there are people who signed up about self-care and well-being, at the end of the day, they couldn't fit, they could not fathom fitting this in to their day. And so I wonder. You've spoken a lot about speaking to the leaders and leadership. What's the message to people who say, I care about my Mm well-being, but I got to get all this work done. I don't have time for this. How do we fit that in? How do you convince people to fit that in? Yeah. And that's why we work with leaders, because it starts at the top. Mm. People see and learn what... They have permission to do what their expectations are. They learn the norms come from the leadership. And so first and foremost, you have to see your role models, role modeling, good behavior and and healthy boundaries and good work life balance. And, you know, if you're if your boss is burned out or on that track, guess what? Everybody in that part of the organization is also going to be burned out. And we've seen that with our clients over the years. It's like all the the, perfor- the high performing teams are the ones that have leaders that are actively engaged in workplace wellness and employee well being. Mm. Yeah, statistics, statistically relevant data on that. You can take that to the bank. <laughs> That's always that weird conundrum, right? Where it, it, if you were to say, like I've I've heard I've heard a study, Sophie. I don't know where I read this, but um, you're probably familiar with it. I was reading a study. Um, that was comparing the kind of the workplace in America versus other countries and how, especially some countries, you know, that have very lax work schedule. And they're like, if you just like looked at the numbers and if you said like, if workers worked, you know, 20 hours and they've got this much productivity, if you doubled that to 40, it should double it. And it, and where that curve starts to go mm-hmm. down, 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 down. And then actually sometimes, you know, they would compare like, oh, you know, this country like has a 30 hour work week. That's a typical work week. And their productivity is much higher than in, than in America. And so it's like almost like we have to break 
it's almost like we have to break a broken model. Like we have this broken record in our head playing like, oh, we need to keep working really hard. And it's actually doing the opposite. Yeah. yeah I'll come. Why, why, why can't why can't we get out of that mindset, Sophia? Yeah. Like, why, yeah, why are we stuck? Help us, Sophia. Help that's, us. That's a really that's a really good question. I'm trying to solve that right now. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like, let's figure work. it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trying to figure out the magic bullet there. I mean, really, it's like one person, one organization at a time shifting, shifting those mindsets. And it's, you know, I think the way you get there is, you know, the leaders of the company, you know, the, the CEO needs to decide that this is important. And then the leaders need to commit to that. I mean, it's a commitment. It is a big commitment and it, because it is a big mindset shift. And, Ooh. you know, we have so much energy and inertia and training on uh, the idea that uh, more is better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and that's, instead of looking at quality outcomes and that it's a big mindset shift, you know, and it's tempting. So it's, you know, like when I was growing up and entering the workforce, it was very much that old mindset of, um, you know, the company, if you have a job, you're there. I mean, remember Laverne and Shirley? Right. And they're in the bottom. <laughs> it's like, it's like yes. you know, you you clock in and then you clock out. And between the time that you clock in and you clock out, you try to wring as much effort as you possibly can out of your workers. And that's the idea of running a company, or that's the paradigm of running a company. And I think slowly that mindset is shifting. And part of I think the answer or long-term solution is generationally growing out of it to some degree mm. and the younger generation is coming in demanding more reasonable expectations demanding more work-life balance i mean there's a lot of focus on you know other demands you know like flexible schedules and work from home options and yes that's great but that's all comes down to qual worker quality of life matters and it's going to take organizations committing to that ideal and that philosophy and then putting their money where their mouth is. And there are big companies doing that right now um, that weren't five years ago. And I think that's really exciting. You know, a, you know, to some extent, they have to because of the job market and recruiting is so challenging right now. But I think that's a good direction. Yeah. But it's going to take some a time to get there because it 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 is very tempting because you can like i don't know if you're a, a check the box a checklist person i love checklists i write checklists and i check things off and i'm like throwing a little party for myself it feels so good right you get that <laughs> yeah. you know that dopamine hit after the little thing and i mean unfortunately we're a little wired that way that's why social media is so effective at hooking us in and so somehow we've got to unhook our brains from being addicted to that you know, dopamine rush of like work, work, work. I got 50 emails out, you know, after five o'clock or, right. you know, but it takes a combination of commitment by the leaders or role models who are setting policy and who are people looking up to, you know, whether it's in government or families or businesses, it's across the board. You know, you can't tell your kids to find a balance between sports and homework and academic goals and that you're burning the candle at both ends and sending emails out at 11 o'clock at night and you know, working half days on Sunday, it just doesn't work, you know, that and policies. It's a combination of, you know, practices and policies, just like the change of the seatbelt law, um, legislation about smoking and cigarettes and banning advertisements. And, you know, it's going to take a combination of efforts because it's a wide scale mindset. Uh, um. You know my, yeah, brain, go ahead. Mark, my brain is stuck on what she said of like, Hey, I'm trying to figure this out. And I was like, let's figure this out together. Yeah. And, and it made <laughs> me think about, it made me think about an idea, you know, two of my, two of my favorite Ted talks are on procrastination. Mm -hmm. and one of them is the Tim urban one inside the mind of a master procrastinator. And then the other one is the one that's by uh, Adam Grant something about original thinkers, but it really yes. has the whole thing in there about procrastination. Mm -hmm. And there's pieces of both that I really like, but from Adam Grant's, I really like this thing where he took, 
and he he broke the model, Sophia. He basically said, people think procrastinators are slackers and they're not very creative and they don't get anything done. And then and then he kind of broke it down and said, if you if you get assigned a task or a project and you're the kind of person that just wants to check it off the list right away, your 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 creativity is probably going to be super low. Awesome. You got it done. But it's the creativity on it's probably going to be very low. If you procrastinate now, if you procrastinate all the way till the end and you have to stay up for 100 hours, you know, leading up to whatever needs to be done, your creativity is going to be low. You're going to get burnt out. You're going to try to, you know, burn all of this into a short amount of time. But if you procrastinate just the right amount, it sounds like a it sounds like a fairy tale, right? Mm. Eating the porridge that's too hot, too cold and one that's just right. And so he's like, if you procrastinate just the right amount. What it does for you is when you're playing a video game or when you're doing something that you would label as procrastinating, Mm -hmm. you're actually thinking about that thing. Mm -hmm. You're actually, it's on, it's in the back of your mind and your mind Mm -hmm. is actually creating scenarios and, and so that, and therefore you're not, you're actually being creative. And so I wonder if there's some model of way of explaining, taking data and information that you know, Mm -hmm. and breaking it down and showing how and why because i think a lot of times people hear that statement of like you know you said this really cool thing you can take that to the bank and it's like i could hear i could hear a leader going yeah but my other brain is telling me there's something sitting on this shoulder telling me nope work everybody into the ground Mm -hmm. and we'll get more so i wonder if there's some way and maybe we can brainstorm on it for a minute where you like where you can kind of talk about that as a model like okay Let's say we have this many hours in a week and this many hours we do this and this many hours we do that and kind of and kind of break down where, you know, kind of show a trajectory Mm -hmm. of where the less starts to pay off and find and find Mm -hmm. that kind of spot. I don't know. Just yeah. Yeah, I love that. The interesting thing that stands out to me there first, a couple of things. One is. um, Gosh, there's so much to unpack there. So. Um, that question of like, what's the balance between too much and too little? To me, I think a lot of that finding that middle ground has to do with self-awareness, understanding what motivates you and balancing your energy. Because, you know, if your creative energy isn't up, like if you don't, if you're not aware of when you are the most creative, then you're going to be hit and miss on your performance you know, Mm. so understanding that, you know, and I think is really an important place to start, like understanding what motivates you. Like some people are really motivated by, you know, giving themselves rewards. Like I'll, if I finish this report, I'll watch a Netflix show (laughs) or, you know, but then there's others that could not care about that. And they, there's other things that motivate them. They might want to listen to great music or be walking while they're on a meeting and like really knowing yourself and knowing what motivates you and your, your energy cycles and being able to manage that. I mean, I think that's what came up for me for an individual perspective from the organizational perspective and that CEO or CFO that's got the two little characters Mm -hmm. on the shoulder of going, it's the right thing to do, but it's not as profitable. You know, (laughs) as I, I think there's a lot there to, there's a lot there to learn. I think that that it takes some effort to look at like, okay, if we can't get this work done in a healthy way, if the only way, if how we're doing it is in design by design, burning people out, we're doing it wrong. Hmm. We should go back and relook at how we're doing things. And maybe we're not doing the right thing. Maybe we're not doing the right thing. Maybe we're not doing it the right way, but let's relook at it and redesign this work. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Sophia, mm-hmm. how are we not, how are we doing well being wrong? By looking at the superficial stuff. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The superficial stuff is easy. It's easy to do shallow things. You know, I mean, it's easy to have a lunch and learn once a month. You know, Mm -hmm. it's 
it, it's easy to, to say, you know, here's some free apples on Friday. Um, those are not bad things. They, they're, they're good things. You know, everybody gets a free fitness tracker over the summer. Mm. You know, I mean, those are great things. And that's the easy stuff. The hard work is, especially, you know, leaders and execs doing that internal work of like, okay, you know, are we optimizing our employees' performance in a humane way? Mm. That's hard work. It's like, do we need to improve our communication? Is this workplace psychologically safe? Are people's performance suffering because there's conflicting um, policies and uh, toxic culture? I mean, though that is the hard work. And it takes a great deal of individual courage from the leadership and, you know, the, the CEOs of companies to take that on. So it's, it, it's, a, it's hard work. Why is it hard? It's behavior change. It's mindset change. It's hard because humans are, you know, we're hardwired, we're habitual creatures. And so to change this big boat of an organization with, with this entrenched mindset, it takes a lot of work. You've got to change the minds of the leaders and how they communicate with the teams under them. And it's a company-wide effort. And I mean, it's a countrywide effort. I mean, take, for example, you know, the obesity problem in the U.S. Well, it's not just that we're, you know, we're not running enough and we're, everybody needs to run more and eat a little less. There's a lot of factors that go into this as an issue. And so it's a lot of hard work because you've got to change minds. You've got to change the food industry. You've got to change lunchrooms and schools. And there's just a lot of different factors involved. And so a big a company is going to have a lot of those same dynamics that also need to be addressed. And that's why it's hard because it's not, you know, it's it's easy to decide to put in a a handicap ramp to repave a parking lot to like obvious improvements that need to happen in the workplace, put in water fountains. The hard work is the human work because it requires interpersonal growth, like self-awareness, interpersonal growth, communication, cooperation, courage, because you've got to, you know, to admit that, you know, we're a little bit, you know, whacked out the way we're doing this right now, and this is unhealthy, we need to grow, that requires a lot of courage. It requires courage before you even talk to anybody else about it. But to bring that up on in a team environment, especially with your peers who are also at a high level, that can be very scary, especially after a lot of those people have been in the career, in their careers for a long time, and like not just older generation, but there's just a lot of, you know, practice and habits, you know, within the organization and personally to, to overcome. So, I mean, that's, I think, why it's most challenging. Yeah. Wow. But worth it. Absolutely worth it. <laughs> wow. It, what a, wow. For me, it was like such a, such a huge epiphany of like, when you asked Mark and she was like, it's because we're looking at all the superficial things. And then, <laughs> and, then it, and then it made me think, I think we should play a game. We haven't played a game in a while, Mark. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love you, Sophia. I didn't even tell her what it was. And she's like, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> All about that. <laughs> okay, let's play a game. The game okay. is what superficial thing are each one of us doing to try to help our own well-being that we now realize mm-hmm. is superficial? And I, I can go first because I thought about it when you were talking. Okay. Um, I, I have been playing a lot of sports and kind of beating my body up, as you know, Sophia. And I, I have been like hardcore at like, I'm going to get massages. And I've already had two massages. I've been in Texas. I've had two massages. I haven't even been here a week. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to have massages. But then I haven't had one single day of seven hours of sleep. Uh, Most of them have been about five hours. And today it really hit me. I was like, whew. The massage is awesome and there's a lot of benefit from it, but it's superficial when you compare it to how much sleep I'm actually getting. And I realize that my brain does not function. I can't even do like a small task. I can't explain something that's so easy for me to explain when I don't have sleep. Mm -hmm. That's my superficial 
that's kind of something I realized when you were talking. Mark, how about you? Well, let Sophia go last because she probably. Okay. You and I are cut from a lot of the same cloth. <laughs> yes, we um, are. Um, Other than our I, East Coast, West Coast rap choices. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love a good massage. The funny thing is, for my birthday last year, I got a, a gift certificate to a massage parlor. I have yet to use it. What? Over a year later. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I lost the certificate and I just recently found it. Um, well, send but... it to me. I will use it. <laughs> I will be flying to New York tomorrow. <laughs> I think the superficial thing that I do. And I love the practice, but every morning after I wake up, I put in my AirPods, I go to YouTube, and I find a 10-minute guided meditation. Mm -hmm. And I lay there in bed, and I listen for 10 minutes. I usually do a little motivational video after that. And it calms and relaxes me, I think. Mm. And then I wake the kids up to go to school and then I'm getting ready for work and then work starts mm. and then the the yeah. day continues. And by the time I get ready to go to sleep at night, I don't feel entirely rested and ready to go to sleep. And so my sleep pattern, like my sister here, Kathy, is thrown off. So mm -hmm. I feel like I'm doing something amazing 10 minutes in the morning, but is it really having the effect that I would like for it to have? Probably not. Mm -hmm. It might be more superficial mm -hmm. than I think. Or maybe I'm just not doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's an interesting question, because when you first started describing this practice, I was thinking, wow, what's wrong with that? That sounds amazing. <laughs> Me too. I, I was do. doing, I was <laughs> like, like, wow, that sounds Mark, awesome. you don't know how to do the game. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> like, well, that's a different game. <laughs> I was like, Mark, you're doing the game wrong. <laughs> but what I heard you say as you continue to describe your daily experience is that What's missing it maybe is taking that experience of calm and peace and groundedness and bringing it with you throughout the day more or reinserting it in different ways throughout the day more so that your overall experience is a better one. And, you know, if you're doing that, possibly getting better sleep would be the outcome. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You're I, I good. You are good. <laughs> I, was, I thought the same thing and, and then and, but as you just said that Sophia I was like oh yeah I maybe the problem is he's like keeping that in this segmented small amount of time but if he and that makes it superficial as opposed to being able to find a way to integrate it throughout the rest of the day or whatever mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's who work out in the gym and they're exercising you know two or three times a week and then expect that that hour of exercise in the morning is going to shift the tide for the entire day. You know, it's yes, more than that. You know, you can exercise for an hour, but that's not going to get you to 10,000 steps. Like if you had a goal like that, you know, there's a lot right. more to it than that. <laughs> it's how you, it's the practice of your entire life, you know? Mm-hmm. All right, Sophia, what's yours? Yeah, so yeah, a couple of examples came to my mind. The, the first thing that came to my mind was had to do with food. So, you know, I, as Kathy knows, <laughs> I have been like really into nutrition for a really long time. And my nutrition has definitely suffered during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have been working in the last year or so to, to clean that up and to get back on track there. And, you know, one thing that I have, which is an effective tool, it's helpful, uh, but it's definitely you can't rely on it, is bringing in alternative foods, like healthier versions of certain foods, like treat foods. So, you know, I have low carb um, edamame based pastas, which are super high protein. Uh, and that's great. 
you know, but what I really need to do is get back on track with, you know, the co more cooking that I used to do, especially with vegetables, because you, there's a lot of shortcuts you can do, you know, with proteins uh, and, you know, and carb replacements. But it when it comes down to it with vegetables, you're really, you know, best option is to cook cook them, you know, <laughs> you can have control over cook it yourself. And I used yeah. to do a lot more of that. And so I'd be better off, you know, making more prepared meals than just focusing on, you know, these, these, and I got a lot in my stocking of these candies that are made with sweetened with xylitol and stevia and, you know, it's Christmas. And so it see, it's a good, this is an example like yours, Mark, where it was a good, it's a good step. Like it's a good thing that, you know, I have these candies made by designed by a dentist that are healthy compared to that but you know I what I really need to do is kind of get back on making my daily salads <laughs> more kale is what I'm hearing right I do need more kale, <laughs> I do need more kale although I do eat broccoli for breakfast every day and wait oh. wait what <laughs> right Mark's like what <laughs> Yeah, that's a habit that I started several years ago. Um, I love it. Yeah, and it's I I love it because so I take broccoli and I like mine. I'll I eat broccoli a lot of different ways: roasted, sautéed, scrambled with eggs. But I really like it blanched, and so I'll just throw some hot water in a glass and blanch my broccoli, and I'll have that with my breakfast sausage or eggs or you know whatever else I'm having for breakfast. And I just like it because it's quick and simple, and you know like the habit of making your bed first thing in the morning or going for a walk. It's one of those things that you make a healthy choice right away and it makes you feel good and helps fuel better decisions throughout the day. So it's kind of one of my drum beats in the morning. Mm, I love that. Mark, we, you, you need to have this conversation with your family. This is like a family conversation. <laughs> what would you, how would you all feel family if we had broccoli for breakfast every day and we tried it for 30 days or something like that? Like be interesting. Yeah, they might move out. Have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting though, if like if you asked your kids if they would take the broccoli challenge with you and then just see if you could do it for like seven days straight and then see if that superficial change would help make a bigger change. Like, I don't know, when you were saying that, I was like, ooh, I'm gonna take the I'm gonna I myself gonna take the broccoli challenge. I'm gonna call Okay, them. yeah. So I want to distinguish something here. There's superficial change. And then there's small steps. So yeah. that would be a small step. That's a small that step to trying to see other yeah. things, yeah. right? So what I was hearing in all of our examples about what a, a superficial change or shift or activity is really something that's good, but it's not sufficient. Like it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not good enough, you know, in, in simpler terms. And Which, so that, you know, I don't want to dis the things that are right right, things, right 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 <laughs> like yeah no no I got that from what you were saying Sophia mm -hmm. but I it, but I love that you do I think one of the biggest things I've heard so far in our conversation that really stood out to me that really pierces me like if I was a leader in a company and I was having a conversation with you and you said that to me I would be like oh how many super superficial things are we doing and I, again that doesn't superficial doesn't I, I know some people might equate superficial to fake not right not mm -hmm. correct maybe there's another word you can call oh, it but yeah so what occurs to me is like the superficial things we've been talking about are things that we do or people do with the expectation of having the big outcome Ooh, that it's not going to have you know and right. so if you're only doing this or if you're expecting this one little thing to have this big effect that's superficial and maybe there is a better word for it i'm not sure what that would be well, there, so it's actually something that had, no, I, I love, I actually, I don't know about you, Mark, but actually, especially as an outside person from Sophia's business and what she does, I actually love that because I think as a leader, you want to hear a heart, a word that really goes, uh, yeah. yeah, it's in its, in its outcome, it's superficial. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but yep. the yep. outcome, the outcome's tiny. You're, I love what you said too, Sophia. It's like, you're taking something small and expecting it to have a big major shift and that's not what's going to shift yeah. yeah i tell you what else stands out for me too and i heard you use the term not good enough right and when i thought about all of our habits i thought oh well it might be good enough but it's not 
often enough. Mm. Right? Oh, I love that, because, Mark. Mm-hmm. Right, because and 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 and, so, and, and you've used it's this word enough. a couple of right? It's good enough, but it's enough, not, but often, not often, enough. often enough. I love that. Right? Yeah. And Woo! and I think about that because Sophia, you've also used the word habit. And I find this very interesting that it's been used in two different contexts, right? We are creatures of habit. And and shall I call it a hustle hustle culture, which, which yeah. is what we like to call yeah. it, right? Hustle culture. Mm-hmm. Creature of habit is get the job done, mm-hmm. right? Got to go to work and get the job done. I got to have a side hustle, a, a, a top hustle, a bottom hustle. I got to have hustles all around, right? Hustle, 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 hustle. And yeah. that's a creature of habit. I always have to be doing something. But then you talked just a few moments ago about healthy choices. And you refer to those as habits. Yes. But here's what's interesting about good enough, but not often enough. It's not, it's, it's, it's good enough, but it's not a habit. We haven't made it a habit yet, mm-hmm. right? It's sort of like the example that, that, that I shared earlier that, that I love the way you responded to it. It's like, yeah. Great. 10 minutes of motivation in the morning. Uh, meditation in the morning is great. But how often are you doing it? How are you reinserting yeah. that throughout yeah. the day? Mm-hmm. You know, um, rest, you know, my, my girl Kathy over here, not getting all that sleep, right? But mm-hmm. when is there rest inserted throughout the day so that it's, because it's, it's good enough because you, you did it once. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, and Sophia, I'm sure you've gone to these companies and, and they love it. Oh, Sophia, that's great. We'll do something today. And then you'll come back to them next year and find out that the last time they did it was the last you time you were there. You were there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you're reminding me when you bring up sleep, it's the same thing. It's like people that starve themselves for sleep all week and they're like, I'll catch up on the weekend. Forget it. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know, it's really yeah. the outcome when we're talking about health, mental, physical, you know, it's the accumulation of regular practices that has the outcome, not the one time quick fix. And that's tough because to your point, you know, we're in this culture, um, you know, the hustle culture where, you know, we want that brass ring. We want the silver bullet. We want the the quick fix. And, you know, that there isn't a quick fix. I mean, back to the question that you asked me about, you know, why is this hard work? Behavior change is hard work because the answer is never a quick fix. You know, it's not liposuction. There's no pill for this. <laughs> okay, you guys, are you ready for my, you both know I love concepts and this is, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm yes. like, okay. Because when you two were talking, I was writing down a bunch of things. Mark, I just have to say, the, the, I feel like it's a qualifying question to ask people, ask mm. leaders. I could see Sophia asking leaders, you know, ask the question, you know, is it good enough, but it's not often enough? You know, it's good enough, but it's not often enough. What if you call this the superficial cycle? Mm. It might be something like Mark is on the superficial yeah. cycle with his 10 minute meditation. I might be on the superficial cycle with sleeping one time a week for seven or eight hours. And so maybe you could talk about, maybe you could break that down and see that could be that thing I was talking about earlier where you're like, the biggest problem that we have right now is we're all on a superficial cycle. We're doing a lot of things that are, that are good enough. I love that too, Mark. Good enough. You know, Mm -hmm. that pick that out of what Sophia said, but it's not often enough. And the, and the, and what's not often enough about it becomes that connection to the well being that you're talking about, mm-hmm. Sophia. You're talking about, I get a little bit of time off, but I don't get a lot of me time. The boundaries are not, the boundaries are too tight. You know, I, if you go back to every single one of the examples that you said, I, I feel like it would be good enough, but not often enough. Yeah. What, what comes, what occurs to me when you're talking about the superficial cycle is expressing appreciation, whether it's your family and saying, I love you. You know, you can't say I love you one year on your anniversary. You can't say I love you once to your kids. Ooh, see, you, know, you can't an employee out. appreciation, appreciating your spouse or your partner or your uh, coworkers or your, you know, your employees. You can't just, you know, 
give somebody a plaque once a year, that's not where it counts. It's, you know, that interconnection socially, it has to be often enough too, not just physically. Ooh, see how this, see how this, yeah. I, when it's a good idea, you can use it everywhere. <laughs> I, that's what I love about good ideas for like, yes. I mean, it's that thing I could imagine. Mark, could you imagine if you told Lauren just once a year, I love you. Happy anniversary. It's anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> she, just, she'd walk out and leave me with the broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I can, and I can imagine the same with John and, you know, Sophia with Tim, like that it wouldn't, that would be a superficial cycle we would be in. And I wonder, I wonder if you could use that as a powerful tool, Sophia, not only for the leaders and in, in what you're talking about, what they're doing for mm -hmm. the actual, you know, people that work in their organization, but it's something you could bring down to the, to the, you know, to the individual level. What mm -hmm. are you doing that you've got yourself caught on this superficial cycle and it's a cycle because you keep repeating it, thinking that it might work. I'm going to work out for one hour a day because that's I think that that's going to cover everything. And then I can eat crappy. Well, put your you're on the superficial cycle, like, and so that might be a great qualifying question to ask. Like, what are you doing that's good enough, but is not often enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering. I've been wondering, pondering. You know, what is the opposite of that? And it feels like being all in. Mm -hmm. Like if you are not all in, when you're all in, you're saying "I love you" every day. When you're yeah. all in, you're taking care of yourself every day. Mm. You know, back to what you were asking earlier, Mark, about you know the rhetorical question of like, why aren't why is why are there only five people here in this training? <laughs> It's like, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, this is why, you know, so we're not all in on taking care of ourselves. You know, there's a lot of talk about self-care and like self-care. Okay. It's like doing good thing. It's all self-care, you know, everything good for yourself is self-care. It's the biggest category you could possibly have. Yeah. You know, that doesn't help. You know, it's like the one, you know, the one self-care seminar isn't enough. It's like all the little great things that you do for yourself throughout the day to manage yeah. your energy, you know, appreciate yourself, all the little things. Mm, I love that too. Even down to the level of like every level appreciating yourself, mm -hmm. you know, like, and then, it, and then it could lead, and then you could see where really bad habits come from. You know, we all know the people that go, okay, well, I'm going to drink two cups of coffee in the afternoon just so I can make it through the rest of the day or whatever. Mm. They're, they're using caffeine as a, yeah. you know, I, I, as a bad habit, right? They're, they're doing yeah. that so that they can kind of make it through the rest of the day as opposed to doing something that was good in order to kind of self-sustain. Right. Yeah. And that takes more, you know, a little bit more work and awareness to set up at the beginning. But I mean, there's a lot of people that like drink coffee and skip breakfast. You know, mm. studies show that when kids skip breakfast, you know, they're not learning. And it's the same, you know, same thing is true for adults. We're not performing unless we eat, you know, a good balanced breakfast. And like, are we, are we, I guess, is it, you know, that awareness I'm thinking now it's kind of uh, extreme, but you know, are, are we torturing ourselves <laughs> or are we taking care of ourselves? Cause it really is torture. You know, mm -hmm. sleep deprivation is a form oh, of torture, I, right? I agree. So, I agree a million percent. <laughs> it really is. And, you know, honestly, you know, I think anybody that, that has struggled with eating healthy will tell you that too. They mm -hmm. feel guilt. You know, I know a lot of people within my life that are struggling with eating healthy and they feel guilty if they don't eat healthy and, you know, they understand what they're doing to their body. And, and it's, it's a form of, of torture, right? They're not, they will do the good enough things, but not often enough. Yeah. I got to tell you, that's a really powerful question. Um, when you said, uh, you know, like, are we tor torturing ourselves? And then I threw the word how in front of it. Mm. because it really forced me to think yeah how are we or how are you or how am i torturing myself um and 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 i almost wanted to add that other part of it that you said you know we're torturing ourselves by not taking care of ourselves but almost like just that first beginning question mm -hmm. about torturing ourselves without the taking care of ourselves part mm -hmm. just to kind of like 
Yeah. Let that marinate for Let a second. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, what do you mean? Yeah. I'm torturing. Like, well, what? Maybe I am. I'm taking well, how am I? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I like it too, what you said, Mark, too, of saying how, because everybody's yeah. probably doing some form of it. And so it's not like, are you, but it's like, how are you? Yeah. Just looking at that pers- from that perspective, just kind of feels like it hits me in the gut. Cause I think about, you know, you can think about like, how am I torturing myself? You know, am I, you know, not eating right or sleep depriving, but then extending that to relationships and other contexts is like, how am I causing harm? Mm -hmm. You know, like how, because it is, you're causing yourself harm if you're torturing yourself, you know, like how are these things that I'm doing that aren't often and help good enough and often enough, how is that causing harm? You know, that's like, whoa. (laughs) Yeah. Got to sit and think with that. Think about that for a minute, you know? That's what I love. This whole idea of get me to sit and think about this for a moment. Mm -hmm. Help me to then identify what is a, and I love this. It's not a habit. It's a cycle. Help me to identify that one thing that I think I'm, listen, Sophia, I'm doing it. I'm Mm -hmm. doing it. I'm meditating. It's like, yeah. But you do it once a day. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know? And then building in and encouraging that constant. Like, I just see that flow. um, And and I I use the word flow. That shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The shift from thinking about how I'm torturing myself to identifying the one thing that I think that I'm doing to address it. Mm-hmm. realizing that I'm just going in a cycle with that one thing right. and now trying to figure out how to turn I that cycle off. into, yeah. and I, I'll say into a habit, but how do I turn that cycle from, how do I turn that superficial cycle right. <laughs> into, into going all in? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question to sit with as we kick off this new year. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is a great question. And and that's a better question, right? I think, I think, I think New Year's resolutions are all superficial cycles usually, right? They don't last. And so it's, it may be a short lived cycle, but it's a, it's, you know, most resolutions will be in that category of a a superficial cycle. Right. And that's why they, 90% of them fail by, by Valentine's day. (laughs) Not even that long, right? Yeah. <laughs> like by the end of the yeah, by the end of the first week. <laughs> yeah, forget it. <laughs> right, right. But 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 you just just think about that for a second, right? It's because we make this New Year's resolution. We make a big deal about making the resolution at the at the start of the year. Well, if yeah. I if my practice is, I only wait once a year at the beginning of a year to set a goal. Yeah. Well, that's just a yearly superficial cycle. I, I, I was thinking the same thing. That's just a big. That's just a big yeah. superficial, superficial cycle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If I'm inserting that, if I'm reinserting that throughout the year, now I'm going all in. Well, and then you give yourself an excuse for 364 days or whatever. If it's a yeah. leap year, that you know, whatever. <laughs> You're like, I'm just giving myself an excuse because I'll re up again on January 1st into my superficial cycle. That's right, and that happens on shorter time scales too. It's like, well, you know, I blew it on French fries. I'll start next week, or I'll start right. tomorrow, or you right. know, or the rest of it tonight. I'll just eat really crappy because who cares. Yeah, it's all those little mind games we play with ourselves, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I love this so much. I mean, this would probably be a good place to ask, Sophia. So, you know, Mark started this question, and I and I love where we started. I have four pages of notes. I love when we're doing a show, Mark, and I end up with, like, <laughs> I have four pages of notes of things that we said. And I love where we started because we started in the space of what's the difference between workplace wellness and employee well-being and, and just how, Sophia, you broke it down and just where we ended up. I'm curious in your mind, I'm sure you're going to percolate on all of this a lot, but how have things shifted? And I use the word shift. How Mm -hmm. have things shifted during this conversation about what we talked about? Yeah, I think something that has really resonated with me, I know I'm going to continue thinking about more and more is behind the superficial cycle, 
you know, how we are torturing ourselves. So I think, you know, in, in many ways, you know, when we set goals, especially when we're thinking about setting goals, it's easy to focus on like the positive things, the positive things that are so different and distant from where we are right now and really good goal setting, you know, sets, has a setting goals that are attainable, reachable and tied and connected to our values. And that just reminded me, you know, like, and I think that's where some, some of these superficial cycles come up because we have an idea like, oh, I think that's what I should be doing. I should start a running habit. Like I went and bought running shoes in 2020 that I've hardly ever used because I hate running and I already knew that about myself. That's a great example of a superficial cycle. <clears throat> but, you know, what are we missing in those moments? You know, what are we missing? And the missing link like is like, what do I value? Like what's important to me? Mm. Because it's like, that is what's going to keep me coming back and doing things, you know, more frequently. It's like, what, you know, what's preventing us from doing things often enough? I'm wondering about those things. It's like, why are we torturing ourselves? Number one, why are we torturing ourselves? (laughs) Number two, like getting out of a cycle. What does that look like? Getting out of a cycle you know, a bad cycle. And it's more than just saying, well, this is a bad cycle or it's not enough. Here's the other thing. But I think it's such an interesting question asking ourselves, you know, how, how am I torturing myself? You know, because when we look at goals, it's, it's an interesting conversation about not just what do I want or what do I like? What do I not like? Mm -hmm. What do I not want? And right. then like, okay, there's some interesting magic there because yeah, they're not deaf opposites of each other. What I want and what I don't want, you know, mm-hmm. that there's some interesting magical differences between those two things. So, I mean, there's a lot, I've got a lot of percolation yeah. going on here. This is fun. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. And I love the, I love the question to the, you know, that you can take back to organizations of what are you doing that's, that seems good enough, but it's not often enough or something. I, lo- mm-hmm. I love that as a question, I feel like there's different layers of questions when you go down to the individual and when you're up here, like, I love it. Uh, I, I always love, you know, closing out this conversation, Sophia, you are an amazing thinker. I love yeah. the way your brain thinks you're, you, you dropped so many good, like lines and things that, <laughs> that I could be like, we went off of. I mean, I love that thing you said at the beginning about, you know, people are important. We really need to take care of them. Like there were so many great things that you said. And so during this hour that we spent, I love how we dissected this idea. And this is where good ideas come from is be intentional and talk about them. And this is how you figure things out. So super appreciate you being on our show and talking to us about, you know, the difference between wellness and well-being. Love it. Sophia, where could people find you? Because you're you're so badass. People are going to be like, I I want to I want to see more of that. Where, where can I find that brain? Yeah, well, you can find us. You can contact us through our website, which is mytruemeasure.com, uh, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of us. Awesome, awesome. Well, if, I definitely recommend that you follow True Measure and Sophia Asgar and see what she's up to. Um, her brain is always thinking about things like this. So if you are interested in this topic, you should follow. And for Mark and I, we'd love to have um, you on our show. So if you're watching and you're like, hey, I have an idea. I'd love to run through your idea you know, machine and come out the other end with something, uh, reach out to us. We have a, we have our own website. It's about to go down show.com. Or if you know somebody that you want to drag onto our, our show so we can have a conversation, <laughs> let's do it. And, um, you know, thank you for watching. And until next time, um, thank you, Sophia, for being on our show. And thank you to all of our listeners, because, you know, it's always going down. And until next time, <laughs> It just went down. Just went down.